Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a very interesting one on preparation for the end time. And this particular lesson, lesson number six for May 12 of 2018, is entitled The Change, and notice that's in quotation marks, in the law. The change in the law. Hmm. So we'll see what that's all about, but we'd like to ask you to join us in a word of prayer as we begin. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we look at these verses in Scripture that talk so clearly about the Sabbath and what it means, what it, how it should be observed, may we understand it clearly. May those who listen in be able to uh, learn some of these important points as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The prophet Daniel received more than one vision about empires. The, there was the great statue there in Daniel 2. And then in Daniel 7, it talks about beasts, and they represent Babylon and Media Persia and Greece and Rome. But that's not all he saw. He saw something really strange that happened after that, um, or something challenging, maybe I should call it. Carrie, you want to help us with that one? Yes. And words as an adversary of the Most High, it doth speak. And the saints of the Most High, it doth wear out. And it hopeth to change seasons and law. And they are given into its hand till a time and a times and a division of a time. That comes from Young's literal translation. Yeah, we try to make that one as close to the Hebrew as possible so everybody would, would be able to say, you know, we haven't tried to pervert the original wording. So why do Seventh-day Adventists understand this verse quite differently from most other Christians? And why hasn't the Sabbath become a major central issue for most Christians? It's obviously a big deal for Adventists. Well, Revelation 13 and 14 make it very clear that the Sabbath will be a critical issue at the end of time. Are we prepared to stand up for the truth? Does this mean the only thing that God wants to make sure is that you worship in the right 24-hour period? Or is there more to it than that? I hope there's more period to that. <laughs> well, worship, worship God as mm -hmm. opposed to worshiping the image and, and the beast. Yeah. So what we're saying here is that worshiping on the Sabbath, worshiping God on the Sabbath, means that we allow Him to make the choices about what's the right thing to do, and in doing that, we hopefully will focus on his character, his government, how he does things, and we will come to know him better. And that's, of course, the, the plan of salvation in a nutshell. Well, Romans 8. Now we're going to jump out and we're going we're to take a, a, a big old picture first and, and then we'll, we'll see where it takes us. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So what led Paul to speak those very significant words? Well, these, these verses that are really... Well, it's something that every Christian needs to think about very seriously. I do not understand what I do. I don't do what I would like to do, but instead I do what I hate. Since what I do is what I don't want to do, this shows that I agree that the law is right. So I'm not really the one who does this thing. Rather, it is the sin that lives in me. I know that good does not live in me. That is my, in my human nature. For even though the desire to do good is in me, I'm not able to do it. I don't do the good I want to do. Instead, I do the evil that I do not want to do. And if I do what I don't want to do, this means that I am no longer the one who does it. Instead, it is, the, it is sin that lives in me. And I can remember reading this in a when I was young. Thought, what in the world is he talking about? So I find that this law is at work. When I want to do what is good, what is evil is the only choice I have. My inner being delights in the law of God. But I see a different law at work in my body, a law that fights against a law which my mind approves of. It makes me a prisoner to the law of sin which is at work in my body. What an unhappy man I am, who will rescue me from the, this body that is taking me to death. Thanks be to God, be, 
who does this through our Lord Jesus Christ, this then is my condition. On my own, I can serve God's law only with my mind, while my human nature serves the law of sin. And then there is no condemnation now for those who live in, with, in union with Christ Jesus. Wow. What a, what a setup. So there have been many different opinions about those, these verses. Is, this talk, is Paul talking about his own personal experience or is he talking about a general experience for all Christians? What do you think? All Christians yeah. go through this at one time or another and actually if all they, the time. If they, if they have enough self-awareness, right? Well, another question that's come up about this passage, is he talking about before he was converted, in the process of conversion, or after he was converted? What do you think? After. After he was converted. Yeah, I, I, I think it has to be after. I mean, the person before conversion, they don't, they don't have a big burden to try to do what's right. So... Um, but he's, he's sort of going over the dilemma, mm -hmm. but then offers the solution. It, it's not like uh, he leaves it to us there. This is the way it's always going to be. Who's yeah. going to set me free from this? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, my, our Lord. So, um, so when he was set free, is it, is it done? He doesn't have that anymore? Or well, is it I just, just, or is it just that, that says, says he was struggling with afterwards? Well, he's he still, he's still, yeah, but then he says, thanks be it to God. That well, but what, well, let's stop and, and let's look at the, we believe in the great controversy, okay? We believe the devil is alive and active, okay? So if you, all of a sudden, suppose you're a person of the world and you decide to become a Christian, how is the devil going to respond? He's going to up the ante and keep at you. He's going to go at you with all guns, all guns blazing. Yeah, I mean, he's going to do everything he can possibly do to you to convince you that so wasn't it, a good idea. It keeps happening. It keeps happening. It keeps happening. So what, what is Jesus doing then well, to, to, to fix that? That's the question. Well, Paul said that uh, he die, I die daily. And he said that he, uh, continue, you know, I, I buffet my body and keep it up under subjection. Uh, so he's continuing to reckon his his old man as dead, yeah. uh, and uh, and. But it sounds like it's spirit. continually happening, though. Even though he's done that, mm -hmm. so yeah. Yeah. it's almost That's, like well, it's almost like you only faith in God yeah. is kind of covering all this stuff. Yeah. If you need to die daily, it means you still got a problem, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. That's right. You have to recommit yourself yeah. to the ways of God on a daily basis. Well, in the verses before those verses, Romans 7, 1 to 14, Paul has some very, I don't even know, maybe we should try to read that. This is really convoluted. Certainly you will understand what I'm about to say, my brothers and sisters, because all of you know about law. The law rules over people only as long as they live. A married woman, for example, is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if he dies, then she is free from the law that bound her to him. So then, if she lives with another man while her husband is alive, she, uh, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is legally a free woman and does not commit adultery if she marries another man. That is how it is with you, my sisters and brothers. As far as the law is concerned, you also have died because you are part of the body of Christ. And now you belong to him who was raised from death in order that we might be useful in the service of God. For when we lived according to our human nature, the sinful desires stirred up by the law were, uh, were at work in our body and all we did ended in death. Now, however, we are free from the law because we died to that which once held us prisoners. No longer do we serve in the old way of a written law, but in the new way of the Spirit. Shall we say then that the law itself is sinful? Of course not. But it was the law that made me know what sin is. If the law had not said, do not desire what belongs to someone else, I would not have known such a desire. But by means of that commandment, sin found its chance to stir up all kinds of selfish desires in me. Apart from the law, sin is a dead thing. I myself was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life, and I died. And the commandment which was meant to bring life, in my case, brought death. 
Sin found its chance and by means of the commandment it deceived me and killed me. So then, the law itself is holy and the commandment is holy, right and good, but does this mean what is good has caused my death? By no means. It was sin that did it by using what is good. Sin brought death to me in order that its true nature as sin might be revealed. And so by means of the commandment, sin is shown to be even more terribly sinful. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. So a comparison could be made to sharp knives. Jackie, you're a lady. You, you, you do a lot of stuff in the kitchen with knives. Is it good to have sharp knives or dull knives? Oh, sharper the better. <laughs> sharper the better. But sharp knives can be used to very evil purposes, we know, can't they? So, but it's not the knife's fault. If it's a nice sharp knife, it's not, it's not, we, we rejoice at a nice sharp knife. I know, I, we have a, a nice set of knives that a friend gave to us, and I was going to pick out the sharpest one when, I was, when there's something to be cut, because it works the best, doesn't it? Well, it's not the law which causes death, sin causes death. The law warns us about how deadly sin is. It is interesting to note that a careful reading of the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy reveal that almost every one of the Ten Commandments has a death penalty connected to it. Why was that? In many cases, God instructed His people to put to death those who disobeyed. Was that an extreme reaction? So why would God tell His you know, people who just He just rescued out of Egypt to, to put to death somebody who was openly in violation of the law? Got to answer that, Brad? Yeah, the way I read this is that they deserve death, mm -hmm. not will be put to death. Mm -hmm. And if you go to the Hebrew, it's pretty much what it says. I think we have overstated this uh, consequence of sin, that they will be killed. No, they deserve death. Well, and, and the, exa the best example of that one is Numbers uh, 30. Uh, I'm sorry, Numbers 15, verse 30 and following, where the, the young man goes out intentionally. He knows exactly what he's doing. In full rebellion, he goes out to gather up firewood on the Sabbath. Well, what happens if you have someone openly disobeying the law, abusing God's commands, and everybody else is watching? You move yourself out of God's protection. That's what happens. And you, not only that, you, in, in, you, you encourage a lot of other people to try it. Yeah, but, but that's, you know, that happens all the time. It's just, that's an, or an, a common incident, but uh, pe yeah. people are uh, taught and, and experience things, but God will ultimately let you do your yeah, thing exactly. and you will suffer the consequences. Not that at the hands of God, God doesn't have to kill anybody. He permits evil to run its course. Now, if well, God, in this, in this if case, God, what happened, uh, just to finish the story, God says, take that person out and stone him. Did okay. God say that? That's, that's what the Bible says. That's the problem. Yeah, I said, hello him. Okay, Gary. I'm, I, I'm sorry. I was just wondering about if you deserve to die, how does it get carried out? Well, and, and, and this is a time we don't have time to discuss that. We can discuss that in great detail. Yeah, we have to talk about, do you do something that results in, a, in the physical death right now, or are we talking about the second death? And, and the second death is where God lets each person reap what they've sown, basically. Okay. Well, those people that are at the second death have chosen not to uh, yeah. take instruction, not to learn, not to ch change their thinking. Our Sabbath School Bible Study Guide says, we live in a faith relationship with Jesus, trusting in His merits and His righteousness for salvation. And they say the theme of so much of what came, from, came before in the book of Romans. What are these merits? I need some of them. The life He lived, His righteousness. Um, okay. His position and the heavenly places. Um, Is that merit a description of somebody's good works? Well, Is that what uh, it is? Our Roman Catholic friends would answer the question like this. The people who are saints are people who have lived good enough lives so that they have extra merits. 
In other words, there, there's a balancing act going on here. And when you, when you come up for judgment, if there are more good on your side than, than evil, then you're saved. But you have extra merits now. You have extra, those extra good deeds that you did. So if you pray to the saints, those saints can actually share their good merits with you, and therefore your balance might go down on the good side. That, that's, the, that's the very traditional way that's understood. I'm just asking, is that what we're talking about here? Apparently not. I hope not. It's just the merits of Christ, not yeah. some, uh, Well, if you're going to weigh merits, Christ would have a lot of weight, that's right? That's right. So, well, that's what, and that would be their argument. And, of course, the person that comes next to Jesus would be Mary. She has lots of merits. So, Well, do we is, have any merits of our own? None. No. no. Sin is so evil and so hard to eliminate from our lives, but the Holy Spirit can help us to do that. Why do so many of our other Christians want to say that the law has been done away with? And I don't... I don't need to. I won't surprise anybody here to tell you that Romans six fourteen says, "Sin must not be your master, for you do not live under the law, but under God's grace." And our people who want to do away with the law, they love those verses. And there's others uh, that, that are similar. Do such verses suggest that the law has been done away with, or do they suggest that w when we have a right relationship with Christ, Jesus Christ, we will do what is right because it is right? Is there, any, is there any hint in Romans 6.14 that Paul intended for us to change the day in which we worship? There's nothing about what day to worship in Romans 6.14. Our Christian friends have used a number of these verses in the Bible to try to suggest that the Sabbath has been changed. And look at some of the, let's look at some examples of verses that they have used. Okay? Um, who do we have the number 13 there? Yeah, so... Okay. From John chapter 20, verse 19 to 23, we, we read uh, the following from the Good News Translation. It was late the Sunday evening, and the disciples were gathered together behind the locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities. Then Jesus came and stood among them. Okay, Fred, is that a good reason why we should start worshiping on Sunday? It doesn't say that. <laughs> it doesn't say that at all. Yeah, well, Sunday evening, isn't that really Monday as far as the, the Jewish system, Jewish yeah. system goes? Yeah. But even if it was Sunday, that doesn't imply Saturday. No. no, no, no. Okay, Gary, why were the disciples in the upper room? We've already said they were there because they were scared to death of the Jews. Okay, you want to read us Acts 20, verse 7, Gary? Okay, on Saturday evening, we gathered together for the fellowship meal. Paul spoke to the people and kept on speaking until midnight, since he was going to leave the next day. Good News Bible, okay. Acts 27. Okay, so does that tell us that we should start worshiping on Sunday? Nope. Not at all. On Saturday. Saturday evening was already Sunday, true. Yeah. But was that uh, worshiping, or was that a Bible study, or what was really going on here? He's, he's saying goodbye to them, basically. We are having a Bible study, and it's Wednesday night here. Yeah. That doesn't make it all. Yeah. Oh. Well, it's holy because wherever two or more are gathered in his name, he is there, but it uh, doesn't sanctify the day. That's right. The first of the Sabbaths there, that's one of the, pass one of the translations of that, Re refers to the beginning of Sunday, which happens on what we would call Saturday evening. That's not a, a, a verse for keeping Sunday. So, Dennis, I think you've got 1 Corinthians 16, 1 to 4. They like this one, too. Now concerning uh, what you wrote about the money to be raised to help God's people in Judea, you must do what I told the churches in Galatia to do. Every Sunday, each of you must put aside some money in proportion to what you have earned and save it up so that there will be no need to collect money when I come. After I come, I shall give letters of introduction to those who have been approved and send them to take your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems worthy, uh, worthwhile for me to go, then they can go along with me. So it turns out, if we remember the rest, if you read the rest of the story, there was so much gold to be carried 
that he had six or seven other men along with him to, to carry all that wealth all the way to Jerusalem. So, once again, is, this, is that a sufficient reason for us to worship on Sunday? No, but some people will, will make a quick uh, association in their head in other translations that mentions offerings, and they'll think, mm -hmm. offerings. We take up offerings during our worship services, <laughs> and so therefore... But this is talking about doing it at home. How, much exactly. off, how many offerings do you exactly. take up at home? Yeah. Nowhere in Scripture do you actually see offerings taken up during a worship service. It's always taken to a place and given. Okay, well, let's move on then. There are some clear references in Scripture as to the day when Jesus worshipped. A good example, of course, is Luke 4, uh, verses 14 to 16. Let me just turn to that very quickly. Then Jesus returned to Galilee, and the power of the Holy Spirit was with him. The news about him spread throughout all that territory. He taught in the synagogues and was praised by everyone. Then Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath, he went, as usual, to the synagogue. He stood up to read the scriptures. So, what, what does that tell us? What did he normally do? <clears throat> Sabbath keeper. Yeah, he, he, he went, uh, as a good Jew... He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath to keep the Sabbath. Okay, Jackie, mm -hmm. what did the ladies do? The women who had followed Jesus from Galilee went with Joseph and saw the tomb and how Jesus' body was placed in it. And then they went back home and prepared the spices and perfumes for the body, and they are crying the whole way. On the Sabbath they rested, as the law commanded. Then very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb, carrying the spices that they had prepared. Now that's Luke 23, 55, right, going over to Luke 24, verse 1. So, does that say we should worship on Sunday? Well, they rested on the Sabbath, didn't they? As the law commanded. Once again, we see that the modern translations make it very clear that the early Christians worshipped on Sabbath and not on Sunday. And they didn't treat it as a new Sabbath because they were they rested and then they brought the spices on the first day of the week. In the book of Acts, we are primarily following the behavior of Paul. Acts 13, verse 14, and 42, verse 45. I guess we can take time to read that really quickly. They went on from Perga and arrived in Antioch and Pisidia, and on the Sabbath they went into the synagogue and sat down. So clearly, what's he doing? Going to the synagogue on Sabbath and worshiping. Verse 42, as Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to come back on Sunday, right? No, come back the next Sabbath and tell them more about these things. After the people had left the meeting, Paul and Barnabas were followed by many Jews and by many Gentiles who had been converted to Judaism. The apostles spoke to them and encouraged them to keep on living in the grace of God. Of God. The next Sabbath, nearly everyone in the town came to hear the word of the Lord. So, when are they coming? Is that on Sunday? No, it's Sabbath. Look at Acts 16. So, from there we went inland to Philippi, a city on the of the first district of Macedonia. It also, it's also a Roman colony. We spent several days there. On the Sabbath, so what, what, did the, what does Paul always do when he comes to a new city? Looks for synagogue. Looks for the synagogue. Apparently, he didn't find them. Find one. We spent several days there. On the Sabbath, we went out of the city to the riverside, where we thought there would be a place where Jews gathered for prayer. We sat down and talked to the women who gathered there. And if you have the privilege sometime of visiting Philippi, there's a beautiful uh, little sanctuary built there, and a nice garden that you go. And there's the river. You can go down to the river, and you can be baptized there if you want. And um, very nice, beautiful little place. So, what did they do even when they were not among Jews? Did they worship on Sunday? No. It was clearly Paul's custom when he went to a new city to go first to the synagogue on Sabbath to preach there. But it is interesting to note, as recorded, we just read in Acts 16, there was not a synagogue to go to in Philippi. So he went out to the, to the side of the local river to see if he could find some Jews worshiping there. 
Paul clearly intended to worship on Sabbath whether or not there was a synagogue or even any Jews present. So uh, how easy is it to speak to our Sunday keeping friends about um, worshiping on Sabbath? Have you ever tried it? Tradition I is stronger than the word of God. Often it is. It's a challenging and delicate problem to try to say this to people. Unless you can present it in such a way that uh, they see the beauty of doing this and make, make a choice. So you, you're presenting them a choice of uh, rather than trying to just grab the chair they're standing on and pulling it out from them. So clearly we need to figure out ways to do this in non-condemnatory. We can't say, you terrible sinners, you worship on the wrong day. You know, that's not... That will never work. So we need to figure out, yeah? Yeah, in the commandment, there is a word that was added there that bothers me a little because it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Mm -hmm. The word it is not, not in there. the text. In other words, keep yourself holy on the Sabbath day. Mm -hmm. That changes the whole attitude towards the Sabbath. This is a day where we seek God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Jesus on one occasion was dealing with a non-Jew, he met a woman at a well. And how did he start up the conversation? Asked her for something. He asked her for something, and then he continued go asking questions. Sometimes that's a good way to, uh, to approach people, ask some questions and see what you can do. Well, James, the elder stepbrother of Jesus, made it very clear that he still regarded the Ten Commandments as necessary for Christians. I'm going to just read you a couple of verses very quickly from James chapter 2, verses 10 to 12. Whoever breaks one commandment is guilty of breaking them all. For the same one who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. So where do those commands come from? Ten the Ten Commandments. Even if you do not commit adultery, you have become a lawbreaker if you commit murder. Speak and act as people who will be judged by the law that sets us free. Okay. For more than 500 years before the coming of Jesus, Daniel and Daniel 7 talked about the future of nations and the rise of a little horn power. This little horn power was still a part of the Roman Empire, but it was significantly different from the previous Roman Empire in some interesting ways. Thomas Hobbes in the 1600s wrote, Jim, I think you've got that. If a man consider the original of this great ecclesiastical dominion, he will per easily perceive that the papacy, papacy is no other than the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire sitting crowned upon the grave thereof. Thomas Hobbes in the book Leviathan. Okay. So he's saying that uh, the fact that the uh, Roman Church claims that Sunday is their day that they have changed proves that they're no different than the Roman Empire. Well... Let's just, I think we have time. We've got, let's look at, uh, at Daniel 7, starting with verse 23. This is the explanation I was given. This is God speaking to Daniel. The fourth beast is a fourth empire that will be on the earth and will be different from all other empires. It will crush the whole earth and trample it down. The ten horns are ten kings who will rule that empire. Then another king will appear. He will be very different from the earlier ones and will overthrow three kings. He will speak against the supreme God and oppress God's people. He will try to change their religious laws and festivals, and God's people will be under his power for three and a half years. Okay? So, so what happened historically? <laughs> Over a period of about 200 years, as the Christian church became the dominant church in the Roman Empire and was recognized as such, a change came about. Pagans who had been worshipping on Sunday as the venerable day of the sun. Faithful Christians were worshipping on Saturday. For a while, when Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire, people worshipped on Saturday and celebrated on Sunday, according to their old habits. Gradually, the emphasis shifted to Sunday, and finally the Roman Church declared that Sunday was the right day in which to worship in celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Did they have any verses from Scripture to support that? No. 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 Well, will the issue of the Sabbath and Sunday uh, ever come up again? Yes. 
in what way? Well, look, for example, at uh, Revelation 13. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the soil. It had ten horns and seven heads. On each of its horns there was a crown. On each of its heads there was a name that was insulting to God. Now, we don't have the time to go through this in detail, but if you go back and look at Daniel uh, 7, if you put all those beasts there and you sort of put them together, how many, be how many heads were there? Ten. No, there were three beasts that had single heads. And there was one piece that had seven heads. So three plus seven is how many? Ten. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, three plus four, one beast had four heads. And the other, one, the other three had single heads. So three plus four is how many? Seven. seven. And here this beast has seven heads. And one of those beasts had how many horns? Ten. Ten. So here we have the Daniel 7 beast sort of put together in a lump sum. And on each of those horns there was a crown. Each of its heads there was a name that was insulting to God. The beast looked like a leopard. That was one of the beasts from Daniel 7. With feet like a bear's feet. That's another one of the be beasts from Daniel 7. And a mouth like a lion's bit mouth. That's another one of the beasts uh, from Daniel 7. The dragon, and by the way, you, you, he, he's looking back. So he sees these beasts. Whereas Daniel's looking forward. He saw Babylon, Media Persia, Rome. I'm sorry, Greece. Now, uh, uh, John is looking backwards, and he sees what first? Greece. Oh. The, the Greece he sees first, because well, because he's 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 not talking about Rome yet. He's getting ready to talk about Rome. He sees first Greece, and what was the beast that went with Greece? Leopard. Leopard. Then he sees Media Persia. What beast went with Media Persia? Bear. And then he sees. Babylon. Babylon, which lion. is represented by a lion. So clearly this has to be a reference back to uh, Daniel 7. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have been fatally wounded, but the wound had healed. The whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. Everyone worshipped the dragon because he, gave, he had given his authority to the beast. They worshipped the beast also, saying, Who is like the beast? Who can fight against it? And without going, taking the time to go through all this, who is the dragon based on the previous chapter in, in Revelation 12? Satan. Satan. Yeah. So he was the one behind all those kingdoms and all what the evil things they did in the Old, in the Old Testament, or in, in these, these uh, not just the Old Testament, in those previous kingdoms. Well, Back uh, down here in chapter, verse 5, the beast was allowed to make proud claims which were insulting to God and it was permitted to have authority for 42 months. If you have three and a half years from Daniel 7, how many months is in three and a half years? 40. 3 times 12 is 36. 36 and another half a year, 6 more makes 42. 42. And here we is, another sign. Well, I'm going to jump down and... Uh, well, I, we shouldn't probably take time to read all of it. The rest of Revelation 13 makes it very clear that this beast is going to try to do what? Force everyone to worship according to his wishes, right? Okay, so it's interesting to notice that in the chapter immediately following Revelation 13, we read in Revelation 14, 6 and what? 6 and 7? A reiteration, of the fact, a reiteration of the fact that God's holy law is eternal. It was there from before the creation of our world down to the end. So Revelation 12, 7 to 10. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon who fought back with his angels. But the dragon was defeated. And he, excuse me. He and his angels were not allowed to stay in heaven any longer. The huge dragon was thrown out. That ancient serpent called... The devil. the devil, or Satan, that deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and all his angels with him. So it's pretty clear who all these individuals are, right? The dragon who was none other than Satan himself made war against God, and we know that he lost the war up in heaven. He was cast out. But what does he hope to do? He hopes to set himself up as the object of worship instead of God. How do we know that? 
We already said everyone, Revelation 13, verse 4, everyone who worship, everyone worshiped the dragon because he had given his authority to the beast. They worshiped the beast also saying who's like the beast who can fight against it. So what is Satan ultimately trying to do? He worshiped. He wants us to stop worshiping God and worship him. Right? So now we're coming down here and I will read a passage here from Helen White. In the fourth commandment, God is revealed as the creator of the heavens and the earth. It is thereby distinguished from all, and is thereby distinguished from all false gods. It was as a memorial of the work of creation that the seventh day was sanctified as a rest day for man. It was designed to keep the living God ever before the minds of men as a source of being and the object of reverence and worship. Amen. So why does Satan want to get rid of the Sabbath? It's a reminder of God, right? Mm -hmm. Satan strives to turn men from their allegiance to God and from rendering <sighs> obedience to his law. Therefore, he directs his efforts, especially against that commandment which points to, the God, to God as the Creator. Great Controversy 53 and 54. Mm -hmm. So one of the most important proofs that Yahweh, God, the Yahweh is the personal name of God, is the only true God is the fact that he can create out of nothing. And there's a number of references to that in Isaiah 40 up to 55, chapters 40 to 55. So why does God ask us to celebrate on the seventh day? Well, more into his creation and, uh, yeah. and uh, sign of his himself as also redeemer in other places. It's, it's his seal. It's our recognition of of who he is and what he what he represents. So, what is the problem with talking about the reality of sin and yet arguing that God's law has been done away with? Is that a well if paradox? Sin is transgression of the law or lawlessness, and you say the law has been done away with, then aren't you entering into sin because you're doing away with the law? Well, you, you, you got rid of the definition. If you got rid of the law, there's no sin. But if you say, well, we want to get rid of sin, well, if God's law had been done away with, what is sin? It, if sin is rebelling against God's law, then those who reject God's worship day are in fact doing what? Rebelling. Many Sunday worshipers try to claim that keeping the seven-day Sabbath is a sign of attempting salvation by works. Is that what the Sabbath is all about? No. Well, Cain and Abel, you know, one boy, he said he does what God says. Then he goes and he kills his lamb. And the other one says, ah, eh, what God said, it, not good enough. I'm going to get what I got and I've got cabbages and potatoes and and that should be good enough for God. And pretty much, I think, it's all about we do the same thing. What I've got to offer should be good enough. And what God says doesn't count. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean what people think it means. Have you ever felt like uh, observers of the Seventh-day Sabbath is a little bit legalistic? I'll throw that question to you out there. Often, especially when we're children, we might think like the, especially the way our parents enforce the Sabbath, we might get the impression that it's a little legalistic. Uh, what, what, why do we think like that? Well, some people would say... Make rules. Yeah. How do you, you know, so when somebody's rules. baptized, well, how do you keep the Sabbath? Well, there's plenty of people who are willing to offer advice on how to do that. You do this and you don't do that. Pretty soon you're kind of caught up in the ritual instead of... Uh, Do's and don'ts. Why, why does God ask us to worship from sundown on Friday night to sundown on Saturday night? Doesn't that seem a little weird? Well, that was the cycle that the Jews followed. And I think why? They, they followed the cycle at creation. The evening and the morning were the first day. Yeah. Well, think of the thousands of years in history when we didn't have watches that we wear on our on our wrist. So there's only two times in the day when you know precisely, okay, bang, that happened. Either at sundown or sunup. Those are the only two times. 
So God says, I want you to start the Sabbath at sundown. So why does God ask us to keep the Sabbath starting at sundown? Well, that's the beginning of the day. Mm -hmm. well, the new God day. When God created, it yeah. was dark. When yeah. He, that was the yeah. beginning of the first day. It was yeah. darkness. And yeah. then went into the day light. Yeah. Then there was darkness again. Yeah. So that's the second day. Yeah. And, and, and clearly, yeah, as you've already pointed, it, it says just in so many words, and the evening and the morning were first day, second day, third day. Evening and morning, evening and morning. That's what a day was in, in, in ancient biblical times. And instead of being weird, it becomes all about God mm -hmm. and what God was doing, what God is doing. But instead more than that, of it's showing us how we go from spiritual darkness to spiritual yes. light. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, now Jackie, I'm going to say something on behalf of ladies. There's another very important reason why sundown on Friday evening is the right time to begin the Sabbath. The burden of preparing the household for Sabbath often falls most heavily upon wives. Often the husband is away working somewhere and the wife may be at home and or even if she's working, she's going to rush home to do a million things, do the cooking and get everything, get things cleaned up, etc. They need to prepare food, they need to get the house ready. And hopefully the husband comes home and helps her. But God wants them to have this work finished early enough so they can relax that evening, enjoy a spiritual time with their families or with other Sabbath-keeping friends, and rise refreshed in the morning on Sabbath so they can enjoy the Sabbath services. Doesn't that sound like a better plan than working? Oh, I got to get everything ready. So you're up, you're, you're busy cooking, you're busy cleaning until midnight, and oh, now the Sabbath starts at midnight, right? And so what happens in the morning? Are you ready to go full speed? And that's why no matter how misbehaving children are it, during Sabbath services, God bless a parent that gets them ready and gets there. Mm -hmm. I, I just always have such compassion on them because mm -hmm. it's quite a, quite a job. Good work. And God, God wants us to, you know, the, the wives, again, I'm speaking on behalf of the ladies, we want you to be alive and alert at Sabbath to enjoy the message and so forth just as much as the men. So why do we keep God's law? Do we ever, ever do it from fear that we might lose our salvation? I mean, the, 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 the disciples were hiding in the upper room for fear of the Jews. Now, is that why we need to keep the Sabbath? For fear of something? Carrie, I think you have something that would help us with that. Yes. The man who attempts to keep the commandments of God from a sense of obligation merely because he is required to do so will never enter into the joy of obedience. He does not obey. When the requirements of God are counted a burden because they cut across human inclination, we may know that the life is not a Christian life. True obedience is the outworking of a principle within. It springs from the love of righteousness, the love of the law of God. The essence of all righteousness is loyalty to our Redeemer. This will lead us to do right because it is right, because right doing is pleasing to God. It comes from Christ's Object Lessons, page 97, paragraph 3 through 98. Let me ask you some questions about that. Okay. Is this, could this be used as a definition of how we should keep the Sabbath? Or is this applying to something else? It applies to every, every. Uh, every act. We do it because it's the right thing to do, as mm -hmm. Jesus said. Uh, as, uh, so when you do all these things, just say uh, we're unprofitable slaves. We've only done what we ought to have done. Mm -hmm. You don't know, owe us anything. Mm -hmm. Yes, God certainly doesn't know us anything. But if we come to know Jesus and really understand the kind of life he lived and we, we get to know him better and better, we want to be like him. If we want to be like him, we'll follow his example, right? Mm -hmm. And not only that, in, in my life, Sabbath is the best day of the week. I wish every day were, could be a Sabbath. Yeah. Uh, because it's an opportunity to get together with friends, to talk about things that are really important, to go to church, to go to Sabbath school. I mean, the Sabbath is a great delight. And the other reason is because he's worthy. He's oh, worthy absolutely. to receive uh, 
power, riches, wisdom, and might, and honor, and glory, and blessing. So everything I have, uh, he's worthy of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fred, I think you have going to add something add to there to that. Yeah, this is a pretty strong statement from Ellen White again. Uh, Signs of the Time, July 22, 1897. A sullen submission to the will of the Father will develop the character of a rebel. By such a one, service is looked upon as drudgery. It is not uh, rendered cheerfully and in the love of God. It is a mere mechanical performance. If he dared, such a one would disobey. His rebellion is smothered ready to break out at any time in bitter murmuring and complaints. Such a service brings no peace or quietude to the soul. Wow. Signs of the Times, as you said, July 22, 1897. What does that imply? Do we ever um, sullenly submit to God's commandments like keeping the Sabbath? Is that a good way to uh, keep the Sabbath? Well, in terms of money, God loves a cheerful giver. So if you expand the term giver to something more than money, giving our time, our efforts, he loves a the one who gives his service cheerfully. I, uh, I delight to do thy will, O oh my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. Isaiah 58, the Sabbath is a delight, right? Yeah. And if the parents of children make it sound like it's an obligation, mm -hmm. rather than a place where we meet with God to learn what He love is, mm -hmm. so where we can develop this all-important virtue in our lives, thanks to the example of Jesus, mm -hmm. kids are sensitive to such yeah. an attitude. <coughs> and <coughs> unfortunately, I mean, you can just see how this could happen. Parents says, hurry up, get ready, we have to go to church. <laughs> I mean, what does that say to those kids? It's a requirement, right? I had, oh, I don't know if this is the chance, but so we went and were singing in the, the gathering place. Strummers and singers were up in a second grade uh, Sabbath school and they went to play music. And it really hurt my feelings that all the adults that came with their children were in the back and not close to the kids. And they were on their cell phones and they oh, were talking see. to each other. And you know what? It, I, I felt badly for those children. Yeah, yeah. Well. And I just said that and oh my word, if somebody is, oh, here's this. and. But this electronic age is just totally messing up with the kids. Jesus, on the last night he was with his disciples, there in the upper room, had some very challenging words to say at the end of chapter, oh, near the end of chapter 13 of John. And now I give you a new commandment, love one another. Amen. That sounds like a strange commandment. Can you, can you command love? Yeah. Then he goes on and makes it worse. <laughs> <laughs> as, I, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And they must have said, hold on just a minute. Yeah. As you have loved us, could we ever do that? No. Then he makes a really incredible statement. If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you're my disciples. Let me think about that for a moment. You mean... If we really love our fellow Christians, everyone will see that we are Christians. Is that what that really means? Seems to mean that, doesn't it? If we don't, we are not his disciples, is what yeah. it implies. Yeah. Well, a good start would be loving our spouses and yeah. our children. Yes. Yeah. Well, can you walk down the street and tell who's a loving Christian? Or well, maybe if you watch them for a while, you might be able to. Could we ever become like the Pharisees in our Sabbath keeping? Yes. 
Absolutely. <laughs> well, do you think of the Sabbath as an opportunity? Not, I'm going to put this question to you out there. Do you think of the Sabbath as an opportunity to enjoy fellowship with God? Do you worship on the Sabbath because it's the right thing to do? You could read that in more than one way. It's the right thing to do. It's the exciting thing. It's a good thing to do. Or it's the right thing to do. It's the righteousness thing to yeah. do. Yeah. It's a loving thing to do. Yeah. If you ask, if is God asking too much of us when He asks for one seventh of our time to fellowship with Him? I mean, this is the icing on the cake every week. Right? Does it really matter which day we worship on? How many times have you heard that question? God has specified that the seventh day Sabbath is a time when he wants to fellowship with us. And now I'll ask you, all you married people, does your spouse care, care about whether or not you remember her or his birthday or your anniversary on a specific day? Hmm. Will we miss blessings if we ignore everybody I see all the gentlemen smiling for some reason. Will we miss blessings if we ignore the Sabbath day? Well, on page 81 of our Bible study guide, the teachers, this is the teacher's section, it asks the following question. Do we observe God's commandments only because we think that they are wise and rational or because we believe that they will make us happier? What about that? Are these good and adequate reasons for keeping God's law? Or do we keep God's law and observe the Sabbath just because we're told to do so? Well, those can be arguments why somebody else should do it, but I think we, we do it just because His law is on our hearts and it's our, we delight to do His will and it uh, just flows out of us. We're, we're we looking forward to the Sabbath. We're not thinking about, well, it's, you know, if I do this, then God is going to twist his arm yeah. <laughs> or something. The Old Testament and even the New Testament is full of commands. We just read Jesus' command to love one another. God's very first words to Adam were in the form of a commandment, Genesis 2.16. Sometimes we almost limit our understanding of commandments of the Ten Commandments, but Psalm 33.9 and Isaiah 45.12 tell us that God spoke a command and created worlds. So commands don't have to be, okay, do this or otherwise. All his biddings are enabling. Enabling. Yeah. So, yeah. so he, his word is creative. It, if Look, he says, he says, let him who has ears hear, he is enabling that to, to happen. Look at Exodus 24, 12. The Lord said to Moses, Come up the mountain to me, and while you are here, I will give you two stone tablets which contain all the laws that I have written for the instruction of the people. I have given you. This is a gift, right? From God, directly to us, to our human forebears. Well, these verses suggest that the Sabbath is a gift. Do you think of the Sabbath as a gift? Many health studies have suggested that human beings need a day of rest. Thus, the Sabbath is a great blessing for mankind. Our bodies are not designed to work nonstop. A number of studies have shown that you can put people to work seven days a week and they will produce less than if they work six days and rest a day. Well, God created the sun and the moon and the rotation of our earth, giving us days and nights. Genesis 1, 14 and 17. So as the creator of time on planet Earth, God certainly has a right to tell us what we should do with our time. The prophet Daniel picked up on that idea in Daniel 2.21 when he said, He controls the times and the seasons. He makes, the, he makes and unmakes kings. He is, it, is, it is he who gives wisdom and understanding. Daniel okay. 2.21 so when another power seeks to change times and laws, Daniel 7.25, it is specifically attempting to take the place of God. The only commandment which specifically deals with time in the Ten Commandments is the Sabbath commandment. So what do we see as the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy? Dennis, I think you're going to help this us there. Is, uh, from the Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, page 83. 
The Roman Catholic Church did exactly as the prophecy predicted, replacing the sacredness of the Sabbath with Sunday worship. The main historical reason that motivated the Roman emperors, along with the Catholic authorities, in the direction of Sunday observance was that this change would facilitate the integration of most people, uh, of most people in the Roman Empire. They were worshiping the sun and were thus keeping Sunday, the day of the sun. This, quote, evangelistic, unquote, strategy and compromi compromise greatly helped the political success of the Roman Catholic Church. So if we're saying you're having a good time on Sunday and you enjoy your Sunday worship, we'll just give you a little bit different reason for doing it and carry on, right? In order to justify their change of the day, what did they tell the people? We're going to celebrate Sunday as the resurrection of Jesus. Celebrating the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. So is it possible for human <laughs> beings to change God's laws? No. No. Well, the Roman Catholic Church figured out that they, they discovered it's really impossible when they came, they wanted to change some of the laws, they came to the second commandment, they couldn't make any way, they couldn't change it in any reasonable, sensible way, so what they do? They threw it out. Completely. Just, we don't know how to change this, <laughs> just get rid of it. And then, of course, they, they, they altered the ones, and the, the 10th commandment they made into two commandments to compensate. They have claimed that they, re they represent God on this earth and claim that this gives them authority to change God's law. In order to separate themselves from what they regard as Jewish customs, they changed the Jewish Sabbath to sunny, Sunday, the venerable day of the, of the sun. A careful reading of Revelation 12 through 14, which obviously we don't have time to do right now, will make it clear that Satan will make an all-out attempt to force the world to follow him and disregard God's law. The rejection of the true Sabbath in ancient times because of anti-Jewish sentiment or anti-Semitism fe feelings was never justified by God. Would it be correct today to say that those who worship on Sunday are anti-Semitic? One Jewish rabbi said to a Seventh-day Adventist, you Seventh-day Adventists keep the Sabbath while we Jews celebrate the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Should we celebrate the Sabbath? From our study of this lesson, what do you out there think? Is it clear why you keep the Sabbath? Can you start celebrating the Sabbath more now because you recognize a little more clearly why that's a good idea, why God bless the Sabbath? Our wonderful Father, we thank you for this blessed Sabbath day that you have prepared for us. We thank you for the time of rest it provides, a change from our weekly activities, our weekly jobs that we do. We now thank you for these explanations that we've been able to study and we take it as an opportunity to draw nearer to you on the sacred Sabbath hours. May that be our experience each week is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.